Hi, welcome to the Introduction to Safety video for the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. The purpose of this video is to give you a very basic introduction to the philosophy behind laboratory safety, why safety is important, including some reasons that you may not have thought of, as well as some very basic principles uh, regarding safety, how to work safely, uh, and procedures in case of any sorts of accidents or incidents. By way of motivation, I'd like to show you three examples uh, of people who have either been killed or seriously injured in laboratory accidents in academic labs just in the last few years. The first one, uh, her name is Sherry Sanji. She was a research scientist, uh, just recently graduated with her bachelor's degree uh, and went on to work in an academic lab at UCLA. She was a chemist. Uh, she was reasonably well trained. Uh, she was working with pyrophoric chemicals. And one evening, uh, or sorry, one afternoon last year, she was doing a procedure in which she was transferring a pyrophoric chemical from one container uh, to another. Pyrophoric chemicals, of course, are materials, chemicals that burn spontaneously when exposed to air. And so great care is used with the equipment and the procedures to make sure that they are not exposed to air. Uh, when working with them. Unfortunately, in Sherry's case, her equipment malfunctioned. The reasons for that are not actually entirely clear, and she was splashed with this pyrophoric chemical, which uh, caught fire and, um, and was splashed on her torso. Unfortunately for her, she was not wearing a lab coat. She was wearing a synthetic sweater, which caught fire, uh, and the burning of her sweater actually severely burned her, uh, caused third-degree burns to much of her torso, uh, injuries from which she ultimately died. In her case, I think it's safe to say that her death is largely the result of inadequate training and uh, improper attention to procedure. Uh, in particular, it's not clear how well she was trained to work with the pyrophoric chemical. Uh, she was not wearing appropriate protective equipment. She was not wearing a lab coat in particular. A lab coat, as simple as it seems, probably would have saved her life. Uh, because a lab coat, if she'd been wearing it, lab coats are treated with fire retardant chemicals. Uh, so even if she had been splashed with this pyrophoric chemical, the lab coat would have bought her enough time to remove the coat, get the chemical off of her, or at least slow down the burning enough uh, that assistance could have, been, uh, could have been rendered in an effective way. The training of her lab mates also apparently was not very good because the first person to reach her when she screamed for help was ineffective at trying to put out the fire. Rather than doing the stop, drop, and roll, which were taught, or taking her to a safety shower, uh, this person attempted to simply smother the flames um, essentially by hand with another lab coat that happened to be, uh, happened to be nearby. So it's a very unfortunate, uh, tragic incident. Uh, she didn't need to die. Uh, she did, even though she was quite young. Uh, but if the training had been better, and if uh, she and her lab mates had been, uh, dare I say, paying closer attention uh, and following uh, procedures more carefully, she wouldn't have died. Here's another example. This is Tarun Mall. He was actually a professor at Cleveland State University. He died. He was killed uh, by being electrocuted by a piece of equipment in his lab. Uh, he uh, was a biologist. He grew plants in his lab. Uh, and in one particular case, a lighting fixture was supposed to have a, a three-prong uh, grounded plug um, for reasons that are not completely clear uh, from the report. Uh, he bypassed the three-prong plug, uh, used one of the uh, so-called cheater plugs to allow him to plug his three-prong plug into a, an ungrounded uh, two-prong outlet. Uh, unfortunately, there was an internal wiring fault in the light, and when he touched part of the light, uh, then he was electrocuted and he died. Uh, so even professors are not uh, immune to uh, lapses in safety. In this particular case, it wasn't so much a lack of training. It was the use of improper equipment um, that then ultimately proved to, be, proved to be unsafe. Here's another example. Sam Roberts is a uh, uh, staff engineer or research scientist at the University of Rochester in a laser facility there. He was working on a rather large piece of equipment that involves compressed gases. Unfortunately, the piece of equipment was not well designed. There was improper uh, venting uh, allowed for, so an overpressure built up. The uh, compressed gas system exploded. He was not killed, but he was partially paralyzed, and he lost his sight in one eye. So all of these are examples of things that have happened just in the last few years 
uh, at academic laboratories elsewhere in the United States. So this is to impress on you the importance of what we're talking about and the fact that the things that we're talking about are not hypothetical, they're not necessarily remote, they can happen, uh, and they can happen even, even here. So here's our basic philosophy. No experiment is worth putting your life or safety or the health or that of anyone else in danger. I like to tell my students it's only science. We devote our lives to it, but we don't you know, give our lives to it. That is, we don't risk our lives in the pursuit of science. So I can speak for all the faculty in the, in the material science department when I say that safety to us is of the utmost importance. We never want to see uh, safety or health issues sacrificed for expediency in the sake of getting something uh, done in the lab. A basic principle of that then, or logical consequence, is that we should never do anything in the labs uh, unless we have some consideration of the safety implications uh, that are involved. Many things that we do in the lab are routine, uh, and the safety considerations are the same over and over and over again. That's fine. We don't necessarily need to start every day uh, by writing down safety procedures for, for procedures that we've done many times. But when we do something new, we need to think about what the safety implications of that are. And even for things that are routine, we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind others uh, about the proper ways to do things. Uh, routine has its own dangers. Uh, we become, can become very skillful and very adept at doing various procedures, uh, but if they become too routine, then the dangers somehow become more remote in our minds uh, and we can sometimes uh, take shortcuts or not follow proper procedures or not wear equipment every time uh, and that's when accidents can happen. Our goal, my goal, uh, as the safety officer for the department is that we should have no incidents, no reportable lab accidents. Uh, nothing should happen that seriously jeopardizes the health or safety uh, of anyone else. What goes along with that is that we should have no excuses. Right? We shouldn't come close to having an accident or having an accident that turns out to be uh, not as bad as it could have been and then start making excuses for why that incident happened. We should do our work in such a way that those things don't happen. So why do we pursue lab safety? Right, well, the first thing, and the obvious one, is that so we and other people don't get hurt. Right? Uh, a more prosaic reason is that because it's the law. The law, both at the federal, state, and local levels, requires us to run our labs and do our work in such a way that the things that we do are safe. A more immediate reason is that the opportunity to conduct research at Johns Hopkins depends on us maintaining a safe research environment. The, the, Opportunity to do research is a privilege. It's not a right, and that privilege can be taken away from us. It can be taken away from individuals who conduct their work in unsafe ways. It can be taken away from entire labs that habitually behave in an unsafe manner. So we need to maintain our, uh, our ability to continue to do research, that privilege, by doing our research safely. But maybe the most important reason, and the thing that I'd like to impress on you, is that good science and safe science are the same thing. Sometimes we get into the habit, of, a way of thinking that says, well, safety is just something that gets in the way of what I want to do. It's these extra procedures, it's these extra steps that I have to take, it's this extra equipment that I have to wear. Uh, but what I want to impress on you is that good science and safe science really are the same thing. That is to say that if I'm doing my science in a way that is good, that is uh, well organized and reproducible uh, and effective, that same kind of science is also safe science. So let's amplify that point a little bit. First thing is that in order to do good science, I need a good laboratory. And a good laboratory, among other things, is clean and it's well ordered, right? It's not cluttered, uh, the equipment is maintained in good order, uh, and those same things that promote good science are also going to be things that promote safety. Furthermore, if I do an experiment that is well planned and well thought out, that is more likely to be successful on a, from a science point of view and it's also more likely to be safe. Experiments that are not well thought out in terms of their goals or their safety aspects are unlikely really to be very successful. We have established procedures. These procedures do a couple of things for us. One is they help keep things safe if we've thought out the safety implications of what we're trying to do. But well-established procedures also contribute to the reproducibility of our science. So again, safe science and good science are the same thing. Finally, when we're working with equipment, as many of us do, uh, good maintenance and good attention to the uh, condition of our equipment 
enhances reproducibility of our results, but it also enhances safety. Here's just a, a nice example of this. Uh, this is just a photo that I took in a, in a lab uh, earlier this summer. Um, and all the photos that I'll show are going to be anonymous so as to us not to embarrass anybody for any, any lapses. But what I want to point out is that this is just a nice, well-organized working environment. Right? Things are neatly laid out. Um, there's a lot of stuff out. Um, it's clear that, that the person who laid out this lab bench has work to do. It involves a number of steps. It involves different things. But things are laid out neatly and it's well organized uh, and it just looks like a good place to get stuff done. There's also an ethical issue to lab safety. Uh, and the ethical issue is that if you create a hazard, you might not be the person that gets hurt. It could be someone else uh, entirely. Uh, it could be someone else, a different member of your lab group. Right? It could be another graduate student or postdoc, or it could be someone else entirely. It could be a uh, custodian or security person. Uh, person. Um, these people are often in our labs, and if we create an unsafe environment, they might be the people that get hurt. It might not be us. Uh, and in that regard, I would share a, just a, an anecdote uh, from my own lab, uh, unfortunately. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, a student from a different group um, had permission to set up some equipment in my lab. Uh, he did so, but he uh, made his own electrical con connection into the uh, electrical disconnect, disconnect box on the wall, um, rather than bringing in an electrician, as should have been done. Uh, and what he did is he left a splice, essentially just a splice with some wire nuts, uh, of two large cables lying on the floor uh, of the lab. Now that wasn't properly done. By itself, that didn't create any particular safety hazard, except that a different piece of equipment in the lab, late one night, um, began leaking cooling water, which resulted in a flood that ran out the door, uh, which security personnel realized, uh, noticed, realized, they called me at home, uh, and uh, I, not knowing about this um, poor slice, splice on the uh, electrical cable, um, asked the security officer to go into the lab. I told him where the wall-mounted electrical disconnects were so that the, all the power could be turned off and the lab equipment uh, uh, could be protected from the, from the effects of the water. Right? What I didn't know is that that electrical splice was lying about a centimeter above the water level in the lab uh, at that particular time. Uh, if that splice had been in the water and the safety officer had stepped into the water like I asked him to in order to get to the disconnect, he conceivably could have been electrocuted and killed. So uh, fortunately that didn't happen, um, but it came close to happening. Uh, and that's of course completely unacceptable um, and is just an example of the fact that the things that we do can have impacts on, on other people. This is one of the most important slides in the presentation, the idea of personal responsibility. You will be trained in the proper ways to do things. You'll be trained in uh, general procedures, both through this uh, presentation and through other more specific presentations on things like chemical safety. You will also have members of your lab group, either your principal investigator or other graduate students or postdocs, teach you proper ways to do things. But in the final analysis, you have to take responsibility for your own safety. There can never be someone looking over your shoulder all the time, making sure that you are doing things safely. So you have to take responsibility for knowing the potential hazards of your work and for taking the appropriate precautions. The corollary of this is if you find yourself not knowing something or if you find yourself uncertain about something that you've been taught, questioning whether or not it is safe, uh, you need to ask. You can ask other members of your lab group. Uh, if you're not satisfied or can't get a good answer from them, then you should definitely talk to your PI. And I think I can speak for everyone in the material science department when I say that we would much rather have some delay in your work uh, resulting from you asking questions about how to do things safely and do things right, rather than pressing ahead and lacking good information and having an accident. So here are some just some general policies and procedures. Uh, first thing is, of course, you use common sense at all times. If something seems unsafe or you're unsure, stop and ask. Please respect the safety of everyone else by keeping your work area, the labs, neat and clean at all times. Follow the established procedures. The uh, student or the research scientist who I mentioned was killed at UCLA was not following established procedures, at least in the sense that she was not wearing the proper personal protective equipment, a lab coat, 
uh, at the time of her, of her accident. If you're going to do anything which is substantially new, working with new chemicals or new procedures, check with your principal investigator and make sure that you've gone over the safety implications of what you plan to do before you start that, that new work. If at all possible, work when someone else is nearby, particularly when you're working with particularly hazardous procedures or hazardous chemicals. Again, in the case of the woman from UCLA who died, uh, if someone had been closer to her to help her, she might not have died in that particular incident. Uh, final thing is that documented safety training is required of everyone who's working in the labs. So this is done on, now on WebCT, uh, but there's also a paper tracking system uh, which you'll be introduced to. More general policies. Of course, we wear clothing or personal protective equipment that's appropriate for the work that we're doing. Lab coats, eye protection, uh, and so on. There is no smoking anywhere in the lab or in any Johns Hopkins University building. Eating and drinking in chemical laboratories is strictly forbidden. Right? Eating and drinking is an excellent way to transfer chemicals uh, inadvertently to the mouth and ingest them. Finally, no children are permitted in labs. Uh, the only exception to this is if special permission has been granted by the PI and the department chair and there's someone to take responsibility for those children. We hope that we never have any accidents, but if we do have an incident, it is important that people know the procedures to follow. Right? And perhaps the most important thing, this may go without saying almost, is that you have to tell other people that are nearby about the potential danger or the danger that exists and you get everyone out of the dangerous environment. The health and safety of other people takes priority over any experiment or potential damage to the laboratory. If anyone's been exposed uh, to a chemical or is otherwise injury, injured, we want to take immediate action to minimize that injury. So for instance, if chemicals have been splashed in the eye, we want to wash the eye. If chemicals have been splashed in the skin, we want to take someone to a safety shower to wash them out, um, so on. Help is available, of course. So if, uh, you, if you need it, call for help. If there's any injury or if assistance is needed, for instance, with a chemical spill. Emergency numbers are 911 or 67777. Now 911 requires a little bit of explanation. If you call 911 from a landline campus phone, the phone in your lab or the phone in your office, that will connect you with the Johns Hopkins security desk. Same thing is true for the number 67777, which is another emergency number. These days, a lot of people, of course, carry cell phones and use them as their primary means of communication. If you call 911 from a cell phone, you will be connected to the Baltimore City 911 service, which is fine, but you just need to be aware that you're talking to Baltimore City and not the Johns Hopkins uh, security. So for instance, if you call Johns Hopkins security, they will know immediately where Maryland Hall is. If you call 911 for Baltimore City, they may not know where Maryland Hall is. You'll probably have to explain that it's at Johns Hopkins, and you'll have to say that it's at the Homewood campus, not at the medical campus. So just know which number it is uh, that, you're, that you're dialing. Uh, first aid for people who are injured is usually inadvisable unless we're talking about something which is life-threatening. So for instance, artificial respiration, if somebody has stopped breathing, um, uh, applying pressure to stop uh, bleeding, uh, or treatment for shock. Other sorts of first aid are usually inadvisable, and the reason for that is that professional help is nearby and can be here rapidly, both in, in the form of paramedics, who can usually arrive uh, at an incident within a matter of just a few minutes, or uh, hospitals. The Union Memorial Emergency Room uh, is, is just a very short distance away. So usually first aid is inadvisable, except for things that are uh, immediately life-threatening, such as stop breathing uh, or bleeding. If you have an accident that gives you uh, an injury which is not urgent, right, that is not life-threatening, uh, or not a serious injury, uh, during business hours, you can get treatment for those non-urgent injuries at the Occupational Health Services office, which is in the Wyman Park building. Uh, the number is here, and you can call them uh, and walk over or be transported over for any sort of non-urgent uh, uh, treatment. As an example, a few years ago, I had a student in the lab uh, who was splashed slightly with some uh, concentrated nitric acid. Um, he also was not wearing a lab coat. He was wearing gloves, but it splashed up on his arms uh, over the, above the tops of the gloves. Just a bunch of sprinkles, really, but he had a bunch of small acid burns, uh, and so he was treated at the Wyman Park uh, building. 
if you're working after hours or on weekends, then the thing to do is to seek appropriate medical treatment. this could be for instance at uni memorial hospital and then you could follow up with occupational health and safety later what to do if there's an accident if you need help you can call the safety office the number is here six eight seven nine eight uh, or security who can of course get in touch with safety uh, for assistance uh, in decontamination so if you've spilled a toxic or flammable or caustic chemical you can get help in cleaning it up uh, if you need help with custodial or building issues you know if there's water spilled or bad odors or things like that you can contact Marge Weaver who will get the custodial people or facilities people over to help uh, for any incident, which is anything other than most minor sorts of incidents, you need to report that to your principal investigator, that is your research advisor and Marge Weaver, immediately. Um, there's, as you can imagine, there's always paperwork that needs to be done. Uh, and it, although paperwork can seem like sort of a, a hassle and a pain, the existence of those reports allows us an opportunity to think carefully about what happened uh, and to try to make step, take steps to make sure that it doesn't happen. And it allows other people to learn from our experiences. So it's extremely important that any incidents uh, that, that occur that are anything other than very minor uh, are reported. Okay, uh, in case of a fire, this is uh, something that could happen conceivably. We're in a laboratory building with flammable, uh, flammable materials. Again, the first step is to evacuate anyone who's in immediate uh, danger. Close the door to the room. Uh, you want to pull the nearest fire alarm. The fire alarms uh, are shown over here uh, at the right. If you don't know, you should probably go and figure out where the nearest fire alarm is uh, to your lab or your office. Call the campus emergency number. Tell them that there's a fire. Tell them where the fire is. You'll need to give them also your information about you know, who you are and where you are. Uh, evacuate the building. This is sometimes more difficult than it seems because uh, unfortunately, you know, even though we do fire drills, sometimes people hear the fire alarm go off. Uh, and they don't bother to uh, evacuate. They figure it's a drill. So go up and down the, the halls uh, and, uh, and knock on doors and tell people to, to evacuate. Of course, we don't evacuate via the elevator. Right? We always use stairs in case of a fire. Okay. There are fire extinguishers in the lab. Uh, however, using them is discouraged unless you've actually been trained in the proper way to use uh, a fire extinguisher. If you're elsewhere in the building and you hear the fire alarm go off, you have a few responsibilities. Uh, first, if you're in a lab, you need to turn off any natural gas you might be using. If you're using any compressed gas cylinders, close those cylinders, especially oxygen, which of course can fuel the fire. Uh, any flammable chemicals you have out need to be returned to the proper flammable storage cabinet. This is an excellent reason not to store a significant amount of flammable chemicals in, for instance, a fume hood, even though it might be convenient to do it there. If you're working with any radioactive materials, they need to be placed in the appropriate place, labeled hoods or refrigerators. Close doors and windows before you leave. That's again to prevent uh, or reduce the flow of oxygen. Um, but you don't want to lock doors and windows, uh, particularly the doors, because firefighters may need to get into your lab and you don't want them to have to knock the lab door down. Uh, and finally, evacuate the building. Let's turn to some things that people ne don't necessarily think of as being related to safety, uh, at least in a laboratory sense, but they are part of our lives and we need to be aware of them. Uh, the first is crime. Johns Hopkins, of course, is in the center of Baltimore, uh, which is a major uh, U.S. city and has some of the same problems with crime that other major U.S. cities uh, have. I will say that the campus and the surrounding areas are, generally speaking, safe, but crime does occur particularly campus is safe. The surrounding environments uh, are perhaps a little, bit, uh, a little bit less so. First thing is be aware of your surroundings at all times. Right? So for instance, if you're walking home late at night, you want to know who's walking near you uh, and how they're behaving. Trust your instincts. If you see something or someone that makes you uh, nervous or uncertain, believe in that right? and act on it. Uh, a good way to, to avoid being a victim is to send the impression that you are calm and confident and you know what you're doing even if you don't, right? People who are looking to perpetrate crimes typically want to perpetrate them on the weakest victims that they can find. Someone who appears calm and confident does not look like uh, a weak victim. I would recommend that you don't walk alone late at night. Um, the one instance that my group has had with uh, crime was a, a graduate student who, bless his soul, was working in a lab until about three o'clock in the morning and then walked home to the Marylander apartment building over on St. Paul Street. Uh, and he was relieved of his wallet uh, on, his, uh, on his trip. So don't walk alone late at night. 
uh, especially off campus, you know, the Charles Village area or the Hamden area. You know, again, crime is uncommon in those areas, um, or, but it does happen. The good thing news is that you can get an escort or you can get a ride. There's an escort van surface. Uh, if the van surface is, is uh, not operating due to the time that you're, you're out, um, you can get an escort from a security officer. So you can do that either by calling the escort van number at eight, uh, 68700 or by calling the general security number. Uh, if someone does attempt to rob you, my recommendation is that you don't resist. It's far better to give up your money uh, than to uh, potentially uh, be seriously injured uh, or give up your life. Of course, uh, with women, there's a, the particular issue of, of sexual assault, uh, and I would not presume to tell anyone how to respond in that situation. But what I would say is that you should think about what you would do uh, if, uh, God forbid, something like that actually occurred uh, and how you would react. It's, it's far better to be prepared at some level uh, than not. Uh, and finally, I would direct your attention to this URL down at the bottom of the screen, which has a nice set of uh, safety tips and information uh, on how to uh, uh, be safe in the uh, local campus environment. With regard to building security, from time to time we do have problems uh, primarily with theft. So the recommendation is that you keep your lab or office locked uh, if it's unoccupied, particularly if you're working after hours or on the weekends. Um, don't let anybody that you don't know uh, into the building, particularly uh, after hours on weekends. We recommend that you keep your wallet or your purse with you or in, the, in a locked office or drawer. Um, the reason for this is that we do from time to time have people who simply come through the building and try unlocked doors uh, and potentially go through uh, desks and things like that looking for, for wallets and purses. Um, so keep it with you uh, or lock, you, lock it up. Uh, if you notice anybody suspicious, someone who looks like they're perhaps casing the building, uh, please notify the security office. Um, a common ruse, this has been actually less common in the last few years, it was more common a few years ago, would be people would just try open doors and if they uh, actually found somebody in the office they would say, oh I'm sorry I was looking for you know, the financial aid office or the admissions office. Well, everybody's actually at, uh, looking for financial aid or admissions at Hopkins knows that those offices are not in Maryland Hall. Uh, and these are people who are typically just casing the building. So if you see something that someone like that, uh, don't, um, you don't have to approach them or confront them, but you should call the security office and, and let them know. Getting to something which maybe seems even farther removed from safety is the issue of computer security. But it's an important issue. Uh, it's an important issue both with respect to integrity of data, uh, but also with, with respect to the integrity of the computer systems themselves. Uh, and perhaps the most important recommendation that I can make is that you make regular backups of all critical data uh, and keep at least one copy of that data off-site. It would be a real shame to have spent three or four years gathering data that goes towards you, was intended to go towards your PhD thesis only to have those data uh, lost due to theft of the computer or a hard drive crash or you know, a virus or anything like that. So make regular backups and keep at least one of those backups off-site. Um, you might find it amusing to know that when I was a graduate student working on my PhD thesis, I actually had five independent copies of my thesis and data. Uh, two were on the computer that was my primary working computer. Two was on a, uh, one was on a hard drive that, that sat with the computer. One was a backup copy that I kept on a removable disk uh, in my home. And the last was a backup copy on a removable disk that I kept at my girlfriend's house on the off chance that my office and my house burned down on the same day I was still covered. Um, that level of paranoia will make sense to you when you're working on your, your thesis. Uh, computer systems should be password protected, of course, so that not anyone can just walk up uh, and use them. Keep your system software up to date and run antivirus software uh, regularly um, to make sure that uh, your system is not infected by viruses uh, or, or worms. Uh, along the same lines, you might consider a software firewall to prevent unauthorized internet access to your to your computer. And finally, I would say that, uh, at least for some computers, you should consider lockdowns or other means to pre prevent access to the computer internals. Again, this is a little bit less of a problem these days uh, with prices of components having come down, um, but it used to be fairly common to have hard drives and memory and things like that stolen uh, right, out of, right out of computers. Um, although these days, perhaps the flip side is that laptops are used much more frequently than they used to be. Uh, and it's pretty easy for someone to just walk off with a laptop. So a cable or other lock uh, to prevent that from happening is probably, uh, probably a good investment. 
Uh, let me close with just a couple of uh, reminders of important numbers. Um, the emergency phone number for campus, again, is 911 from a campus phone. That will connect you, again, to the Johns Hopkins uh, Security Office. You can also call 911 from a cell phone, but that connects you with the Baltimore City uh, Emergency Services, which is fine for things like fire and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but you need to know that you'll have to tell those people specifically where you are. Um, finally, you can also call a campus emergency number, which is 67777. For general security things, information and inquiries and things like that, the security number is 64600. There's the escort van number here, 68700. The Occupational Health Office, which I mentioned, is in the Wyman Park building. That's the place where you can go for treatment of non-urgent uh, medical conditions. Uh, their number is 60450. My recommendation would be if you have some sort of lab incident and you're on your way over there for treatment, that you call them or have someone else call them uh, so that uh, they can be prepared for your arrival. We do have a Health, Safety, and Environment Department at Johns Hopkins. Their number is 68798. They can help with all sorts of things. They help with decontamination after chemical spills, but they would what they would prefer to help with is uh, helping you plan your experiment and make your lab environment safe ahead of time. So if you simply want someone to talk with about procedures and equipment and things in your lab, you can call them the uh, safety person for, for Homewood. His name is Perry Cooper, and he would be very glad to come over uh, and work with you to help make your lab uh, safer. Finally, Ms. Marge Weaver is our department business manager. Uh, her number is here, 65399. She is responsible for things like uh, reporting of accidents, but generally speaking, she just knows a lot uh, and knows a lot of people and how to get things done. So inquiries that, uh, for at least for me, that I don't seem to know where to go, I go to Marge with, and she always knows the right person to talk to uh, and can get things done. So finally, in summary, let me just reiterate, uh, reiterate our our firm conviction of the Faculty of Material Science that there are no experiments that are worth putting your life or safety at risk. We want everything to be done with the utmost attention to the safety aspects uh, so that no one ever gets hurt. As I tried to say earlier, we think that good science and safe science are the same thing. So we don't think of safety as something that gets in the way of things done. Rather, safety goes hand in glove with doing science properly and doing it, doing it well. You have the primary responsibility for your own safety. Right? Again, no one can be there looking over your shoulder all the time. You'll be trained in the right way to do things, but having been trained, you need to take responsibility for yourself to say, I will follow the procedures that I was taught, to say, I will use the protective equipment that's appropriate for whatever task that I'm doing, and to say that I will ask questions and bring up issues if I think that things are unsafe or if I have any question about the safety or the right way to do things. Finally, there's this ethical issue. If you do something unsafe, if you create an unsafe environment, it might be someone other than you that gets hurt. And I think that none of us would like to have to live uh, or have on our conscience um, the knowledge that someone else was seriously injured or even killed based on something that we had done uh, through a lapse in uh, safety or in procedures. So for that reason as well, uh, we try to do everything uh, in a safe and a proper manner as we can. This concludes our introduction to safety. Uh, depending on your role in the department, you may be asked to uh, con complete additional safety training modules on different issues such as chemical or radiation training, lasers, and such like. Let me just say in closing that if you ever have any questions about safety or the right way to do things, the, the person to talk to is your PI, that is your research advisor, uh, or you can also talk to the safety officer who at this point is, uh, is me, and I would be happy to try to help you out resolve any issues that might come up uh, in your labs. Thanks for your attention.